This morning we're looking at Mark chapter 9 and verses 30 through 32, just um, three verses. But again, we realize that the Lord does not put anything into his word by accident. There are no unnecessary details that uh, the Lord intends for us to read it all and to profit from all of it. Uh, we're not covering every jot and tittle. That was something that um, certainly I tried to do earlier on in the ministry, but um, I am trying to cover that, which is perhaps the most striking thing about this text. We'll, we'll, we'll try to deal with uh, everything that we do see here, but let's go ahead and read the text. In Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 32, and again, this takes place after the Mount of Transfiguration, after the deliverance of the young man who had the demon possession. And from there they went out and began to go through Galilee. And he was unwilling for anyone to know about it. For he was teaching his disciples and telling them, the Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. But they did not understand the statement, and they were afraid to ask him. The Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now again, remember that, as I just mentioned, Jesus had delivered the demon-possessed boy. and That was in Caesarea Philippi. After that, he determined to go through Galilee. He was now heading south with his disciples. Again, Caesarea Philippi, unless you're looking at a map, you would have probably have no idea where that is, but... In relationship to Israel, it is above Galilee. Now he's passing through Galilee, and he's on his way to Jerusalem. The reason being is um, it's nearing the end of Jesus' ministry. It's about time for him to complete the work that he has come into the world to do. And I think you know pretty well what that is. We've just read about it in our text. Jesus came into the world, of course, to teach the gospel, to preach the gospel, to become the gospel. I mean, he is the good news, the work that he has done for us in order to save us. But in order to complete that work, he had to go to Jerusalem in order to lay down his life, in order to pay for the sins of his people. If Jesus had not gone to the cross, we would all be lost. Jesus had to be betrayed. He had to be handed over to the Romans. He had to be crucified, and this had to happen in Jerusalem. Now, we are going to read that he is going to, as he heads south, still minister in Judea. He's still going to go east beyond the Jordan. But the reason why he's heading south now is he is heading toward Jerusalem for that final act, as it were, of his, of his work by which he would save us. And in order to get there, he had to pass through Galilee. Now, we read again that he didn't want anybody to know about it. And sometimes this, this strikes us as unusual because Jesus came into the world to reveal the Father. He came in to minister the word. He came to preach. He came to perform miracles, to prove who he was so that people would listen to the message. And yet we read on several occasions here he did not want anyone to know about this particular trip. But the reasons are really at least three, at least three that I could think of. I'm sure there are others. That it was no longer safe for Jesus uh, as his ministry continued to multiply, and we've seen he's been in a number of places preaching, the opposition continued to multiply, and of course the potential that he might be arrested, but yet his work wasn't complete, so he needed to avoid that. Uh, secondly, he also didn't want to be delayed. Uh, the needs were many in Israel. And Jesus didn't necessarily come into the world to meet every single one of the needs that were present at that time, although he did meet a tremendous number of them. He didn't come to heal absolutely everyone, and yet those needs might prevent him from being able to get to Jerusalem on time. So again, he wanted his trip through Galilee to be somewhat secretive. But then thirdly, and most importantly, we read in our text that he needed to spend more time with the disciples. That was another very important thing Jesus came to do, not only for himself to teach, but to prepare and equip those who would be teaching after his work was done. Now, these men still had a great deal to learn, and the Lord needed to teach them. Uh, they particularly needed to be ready for his coming crucifixion, 
to know that it was going to take place and to be able to carry on the work when he was done. And so as they were walking, he began to teach them. And again, especially teaching them that which he introduced a little bit earlier on. The Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him. When he has been killed, he will rise three days later. I do want you to notice their reaction to his statement here. Two things. They, they didn't understand what he was saying. It's not that they couldn't understand the words. I mean, those words were plain enough. And this is the third time that they have heard Jesus speak about it. The first time was when Peter rebuked Jesus. The second time was what we saw, I believe, last week when they heard it, but they said nothing. Now, this was the third time. They knew what he was saying. They didn't have any problem with the words, but they just couldn't understand how this could be, how the Messiah could die. Now, they believed that his kingdom was about to come because Jesus came to bring the kingdom of heaven. They knew from the scriptures that the kingdom of God would last forever. They didn't know exactly what kind of a kingdom it was. At least they had an idea of what, what they thought it was. They didn't know exactly how it was going to spread itself and work itself into the world, although Jesus had told them. That's what the kingdom parables were all about. But how many times have you read the kingdom parables and didn't understand what Jesus was saying and needed to think about it some more and so forth? They knew certain things, but their idea of the Messiah's kingdom was a political kingdom that he was going to overthrow the Romans and restore the kingdom to Israel. Those are the first words that they basically, well, not the first words, but the last words, actually, they asked Jesus before he ascends to heaven. Is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times of the seasons that have been appointed by the Father. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. This is the kingdom that Jesus was referring to. As far as Israel was concerned, it was the new Israel that was going to take the message of God throughout the world, that is, those who were truly redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ from both Jews and Gentiles. That's what they didn't understand. So the idea that Jesus was going to be crucified, that he was going to die, that he was going to rise again from the dead, how did that fit into the picture of this political Messiah who was going to overthrow the Romans? They did not understand. But also notice, secondly, that not understanding, they were afraid to ask. Uh, Peter, earlier when he heard that Jesus was going to die, rebuked Jesus. And I think the disciples remember what Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're acting like Satan. I don't think the, uh, the disciples wanted to uh, make themselves open to that kind of rebuke again. And... Earlier, they had been rebuked for their lack of faith. Uh, they weren't able to cast the demon out because they didn't have faith. So they have these two things, as it were, uh, that, that are, are riding behind them. Two recent experiences and perhaps are a little bit reluctant now to ask Jesus what he means when he tells them that he must die. So they just remained quiet. Now, one thing I really want us to focus on in, in this particular text is the way that this applies to us. Because I think we're fairly, uh, we're, we're fairly taught, I think, aware we understand things that the disciples didn't understand, at least at this point in their lives, because we do have the complete scriptures and we have been reading them and studying them for some time. But we do need to understand that what Jesus is saying to the disciples, he didn't say these things just for them, even as the letter that Paul wrote to the Ephesians wasn't just for the Ephesians. It, it's also for us. Everything that Jesus gave to his disciples was meant to be for all of his disciples, including the instruction that he gave them and including the rebukes and reproofs. And I think we have here, at least on Mark's perspective, some reproof, the fact that they did not understand and the fact that they were afraid to ask. You realize, of course, that um, what it is they didn't understand is something that we need to understand if we are to carry on the work that they did. Now, thankfully, 
the disciples eventually did learn what they needed to know. They eventually completed the work which the Lord had given them to do. And they have entered into their rest with the Lord Jesus Christ. Their work is done. But our work is not done. There are things that, that we need to do. We need to follow in their footsteps. We need to do what it was they were doing. At least we need to do our part as the Lord has called us. And so if we are to do that, there are things that we need to learn as well as they, as Jesus was equipping his disciples to be able to carry on the work once he was, was finished. Basically, their work is done, they're finished, and through several successive generations of Christians, the work has now fallen on our shoulders to complete. And so there are things that we need to know before we can do the work the Lord has called us to do and enter into our rest. And the question that the Lord sets before us this morning is this, will we do it? Will we learn from the Lord and will we do what he calls us to do? Or will we continue to avoid the truth because we're afraid? I think, again, what the disciples were doing here, they were in a state where they were afraid to ask the Lord what was going to happen because of the implications it meant for them. Jesus, we're going to look at this in a little bit, but the fact that Jesus was going to be removed meant that they needed to grow up and they needed to step up and they needed to do the work that Jesus was doing before. He had been a convenient shield, as it were, up to this point, protecting them as a shepherd protects his sheep. But now they were going to have to step up to the plate as shepherds and they were going to have sheep to care for. They needed to grow up. The fact is, we need to grow up as well. We need to grow up. We need to become what the Lord has called us to become. We need to step up to the plate. We need to be able to do this work so that we can advance the kingdom of heaven in our generation. That's the work the Lord calls us to do. So this morning, I want us to consider two things, at least two main things, that the Lord does call you to grow in your understanding of him and his will and, and of course, the carrying out of his will. But I want you to see, too, that there are three obstacles that stand in your way. And we need to know what those are so that we might overcome them. Now, first of all, the Lord calls you to grow, to grow up and you know, to mature, to step up to the plate, to become a spiritual adult. You need to grow in your understanding of him. You need to grow in your knowledge of his will and, of course, in your ability and desire to do it. Now, Peter writes in our meditation, I'll just make a couple of references to a few passages that also give us this exhortation. 2 Peter 3.18. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Peter wrote this to his audience, but again, when an apostle wrote to a church, he was giving instruction to the whole church throughout the ages. And this particular exhortation exhorts us to two things in particular. Two things we are to grow in. First of all, in grace. The Lord wants us to grow in grace. It's one of the reasons why he gives us the means of grace. is so we can acquire grace. He wants us to be filled with the Spirit of God. But I think he also wants us to grow in our experience of that grace, to be able to use that grace. Have you ever um, been in a situation where it, perhaps you've spent a lot of time with the Lord in prayer? Maybe you've spent a good deal of time in his word. Maybe you've been uh, praying a great deal and you've been worshiping and you feel filled with the Spirit of God. But then what have you done with the power that the Lord has given to you? Have you gone out and used it in, in a fruitful way to help other people? Or did you sort of bask in that, that warm sense of his love and, and that fullness of his power and then perhaps you know, dis, you know, give it away somehow by doing something that was worldly and losing it all? We need to know how to gain that strength. We need to know how to use it and to nurture it. We need to know how to keep it from, from being lost the Lord wants us to grow in the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in our experience of those things and how to use it well. Of course, that's also where the knowledge comes in. 
certainly the Lord wants us to know what we need to know, to know his word and to know his will. That's one of the reasons why we study the Bible. But I do believe he also wants us to know Jesus, to learn about him, to put him on, as it were, not, not to put him on in the sense that we're going to deceive him, but to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and to become like him, to, as Paul said, to know the power of his resurrection, this power of the fullness of the Spirit, which we've been talking about, but also the fellowship of his sufferings. Because as you and I set our hearts to do what Jesus has called us to do, it is going to bring about persecution. There's no way to avoid it. Uh, all who will live godly in Christ Jesus who will, will be persecuted. And so the Lord wants us to grow in that knowledge as well. It's not a bad thing to be persecuted. It's actually a blessing. It shows that we're moving in the right direction and not just spinning our wheels or maybe hiding our lights under a bushel, uh, being secret disciples for fear of the Pharisees. That was the problem of many in Jesus' day. But that's not what the Lord wants us to be. He says, take the, the bushel off the light and let that light shine so that all men can see it but realize as it does, you're going to suffer persecution and enter into the fellowship of his sufferings. But the Lord calls you to grow in that area, grow in grace and grow in knowledge. In short, as I said before, you are to press on to maturity. You are to grow up. Now, this isn't a problem that, that just our age our generation has been facing. It's one that they were facing in the early church, which is why there are so many exhortations in Scripture to this very thing. Here's another one from the author to the Hebrews in Hebrews 5, verses 12 through 14. He says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Now, in one sense, the Lord says you are not to be continually, as it were, a perpetual student, always learning but never actually doing. And sadly, that's what we find ourselves doing in church oftentimes is learning. We think that what the Lord has called us to do is to master systematic theology, master what the Bible says, memorize the Old Testament and the New Testament, get as much knowledge as we can in our minds. But, you know, I think the Lord will more greatly bless and honor those who may have less knowledge but actually do more because the, the end of our understanding is that we may not only know the Lord, but actually do his will. So there's one sense in which we are not always to be a perpetual student. I mean, we are always to be learning. But realize you're never going to know everything. You're never going to know it all. But there does need to be an end to discipleship and a beginning of work, what the Lord actually calls us to do. That was the end for which the Lord gave teachers, as we've already read in Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. I won't read that again. But again, God gave gifted men to the church to equip the saints to do the work. And of course, the Lord wants us to get established in that truth so that we will be able to stand firm and not be blown, you know, blown every direction by every wind of doctrine, that we would know where we stand because there's a lot of false teachers in the world. And knowing where we stand, be better able to serve the Lord. Again, Ephesians chapter 4, the purpose for which the Lord gave us teachers. So the exhortation is we need to grow, we need to learn. Jesus was ministering to his disciples so that when he was gone, they could step up to the plate, they could do the work he was doing, they could carry on the work of the kingdom of heaven. As a matter of fact, they did. The kingdom continued to grow. Thankfully, it reached us, and the Lord saved us by it. But the Lord doesn't want us to remain forever infants or even children in that sense. He wants us to grow up to adulthood. He wants us to reach maturity. He wants us to step up and do the work. So he wants us to grow. 
Now, I think we, we know that, but of course we need to be exhorted to that again because sometimes it's hard to keep everything that God says in his word in our minds and active in our lives all the time. We can forget simple things like this. So we need to be exhorted to this again, but let's deal with, secondly, at least three things that tend to get in our way of growing in the Lord. Now, the first thing that gets in your way, of course, is the world. And I'm going to deal with um, things that perhaps we don't, um, we don't often deal with. Of course, the devil is going to stand against you. The world and its wickedness is going to stand against you. Your flesh is coming, going to come against you. But those aren't the three things that I'm thinking about here. And when I'm talking about the world here, I'm not, I don't mean the things that God said, that Jesus said, that you had to give up before you even you know, began to follow him, before you actually entered into his kingdom. We're assuming that that's already a done deal. You've repented of your sins. Now that, of course, is a continual struggle. That does get in your way, but that's not what I mean by the world. What I'm thinking here is something that's a little bit simpler, and that is pleasure. Pleasure gets in the way. What I mean here, of course, is the fun. Not sinful fun, because again, that's something you've already repented of, and I realize it's still a struggle, but again, we, we understand that. But I mean here the legitimate kind of fun that you can have, the lawful kind of fun. Uh, Bunyan in his Pilgrim's Progress, when we get to it again, I'm going to I'm going to burn World Vanity Fair out before we get to Vanity Fair. So you're going to know everything about Vanity Fair. But uh, the fact is, when the pilgrims came into Vanity Fair, Bunyan describes the place as having everything in it that might tempt pilgrims off the path. Things that were unlawful, the sinful things, but also things that were lawful. Now, why would Bunyan say that? Unless it was actually a danger that the Bible warns us against. You realize that Things that aren't sinful in and of themselves can be more dangerous than sinful things because they can become sinful things for you as well. Anything that is fun, if it captures your heart, if it takes control of your life so that it has power over you, that for you becomes a sinful thing. Because Paul did tell us in Ephesians, I believe, chapter 5, not to be drunk with wine, but to be filled with the Spirit of God. And he didn't mean just wine there. You're not supposed to be under the control of alcohol or drunk with it or you know, uh, have an addiction to it or to any kind of drugs or to food or to games or sports or anything that can capture your heart and take you away. The problem is these things can hold you back. They can steal your time. They can capture your heart. They can keep you from moving forward and growing. As a matter of fact, they can keep you a perpetual child because you're so engrossed in having this kind of fun that you give all your time to it. You give your heart to it. Your life is devoted to it. And as a result, you don't spend the time with the Lord that you should and you don't grow. And so you remain a child and you don't become an adult. So how can you overcome this particular roadblock? Well, you need to give it up. Right? You at least need to bring it under control. You need to pray that God would give you the grace to be able to do that. Uh, re realize, too, that when you're, when you're doing these kinds of things, and we all struggle with them because you know, pleasure is fun. Wouldn't, be ple wouldn't call it pleasure if it wasn't. We struggle with this, and it's continually vying for us. But when we do these things, realize that all you're doing is you're serving yourself. That's what pleasure is. You do things that you like. I mean, think about who benefits from the kind of pleasures that you enjoy. Now, it's not wrong to have recreation. It's not wrong to have fun. It's not wrong to have some things that are pleasurable. We all need those things. But I'm talking about when they become too dominant in your life. They can cripple you. Just remember this. You know, not only is this self-serving, and not only does it really not profit uh, anyone but you, and that in a very, very small way. You know, even physical exercise, the Bible says, is, is profitable, but only a little bit. 
where his godliness is profitable not only for this life but for the age to come. But you're basically portioning out your life to that thing and you're pouring your life down a drain. You know, time is so precious. Time is what your life is made of. And you only have so much time to do so much in this world for the glory of God. You only have so much time to actually store up treasures in heaven and prepare for the day of judgment and prepare other people for the day of judgment, right? But when you give yourself to these kinds of things, you're not doing any of those things. It's like your life is like liquid in a bottle. And you take that, that liquid and you pour it in this funnel that just goes down a hole in the ground and disappears. It's gone. But when you invest time in serving the Lord, you're basically putting it in a place where you can keep it forever. You're going to be rewarded forever. Remember, too, that if you become too addicted to pleasure, if there are people who depend on you to take care of their needs or they need your help and so forth, and you're not providing it because you're so caught up in having fun, you're actually hurting those people. We all have gifts that the Lord calls us to minister to one another, and if we can't do it because we don't have time, because we've given too much time away to something else, then we're actually injuring them as well as, of course, robbing ourselves of the rewards that we might otherwise have, and we are stunting our spiritual growth. I hope you can see that can be a very large obstacle. As a matter of fact, it can even stop people from entering into the kingdom of heaven in the first place because they don't want to give that thing up, even if it is something that isn't sinful in and of itself. So again, things that may not necessarily be sinful, can still stop you. So don't let the world get a hold of your heart in that way. Be willing to die to yourself, as Jesus said. Pick up your cross and follow him and use your time for his glory. Now, the second reason that you may not be growing as you should is perhaps a little bit more basic, and that is maybe you really don't understand what it is that the Lord wants you to do. I hope you don't have that problem in this particular church. At least we've been striving uh, you know, to uh, eliminate that particular problem, trying to bring the very best kind of teaching that we can bring. But you do realize that there are a number of churches today where the people of God aren't growing because the teachers aren't teaching the things that they need to teach. It seems like all the pastors today want the mega church, right? They want the big church because that makes them feel more important and more successful and more blessed of the Lord if the church is huge and it seems to be vibrant and they're able to do things. But there is a price that has to be paid, not always, but very often to get those big churches. And that is they need to water down doctrine. And they need to hide the things that are not very popular so that they don't offend people and those people not come back. I mean, this would be one of those things that we're talking about right here. The fact that we have to die to ourselves and serve the Lord. The fact that we need to give up our fun in order to uh, give ourselves to the Lord because it's profitable for us and for others. We shouldn't be pouring our lives down a drain. But there are other things as well that go along with this. The Ten Commandments. People don't want to hear about the Ten Commandments. They don't want to know what their duty is. Just tell me that Jesus loves me. Tell me that everything is well and that I'm on my way to heaven. Just tell me good things and I'll come, but don't tell me about the commandments. Don't tell me about repentance, that I've got to turn from my sins. Don't tell me that I have to turn from every sin or that I have to be holy. People don't like that word holiness. And you know, sadly today, People don't want to hear about the cross of Christ either. They don't want to hear about that bloody death that Jesus was put on the cross and his blood was shed for sinners because people don't like to hear things like that. Well, they don't like to hear that, you know, they don't like to hear that Jesus had to die in order for you to be saved, and they also don't want to hear that they have to die in order to be saved if they are to enter into heaven. And because of this, there are so many professing Christians who believe that they can live just like the world lives, essentially the same, and still make it to heaven. But that's not what Jesus meant when he said that the path which leads to life is narrow. 
It's narrow in the sense that Jesus is the only way, but it's also narrow in the sense that you cannot hold on to the world. You cannot hold on to your sin and still expect to walk that path. Again, Bunyan, in another analogy, pictured it as a very narrow passage in a wall, kind of like the one we just saw in, uh, well, in chapter 8 of Pilgrim's Progress about the man who had to fight his way into the, into the palace so that he could get up on top where everybody was blessed. In this case, there's all these people on a mountaintop, and they're in the sunshine, and they're blessed, but Bunyan's on the outside in the freezing cold, and he can't get to them because of this wall, so he searches around the wall until he finally finds an opening. And he tries to get through that opening, and he can't do it because he's holding on to the world, and he's holding on to his sins, and he keeps letting go of all of these things until finally he can just, with all this might, squeak through that wall, but he had to leave the world and all his sins behind, but he finally got in. And he was meaning to say by that that the path is narrow and there is room only for body and soul, but not for body, soul, and sin and the world. Those things have to be given up. So again, how can you overcome this obstacle? How can you avoid the ignorance that is in the churches that might cause you to believe that you can load up your wagon and bring the world in your sin too and just go down the broad road and end up somehow in heaven. Well, you do need to join yourself, first of all, with a church that teaches the truth. You need to be willing to allow that truth to work in your lives, in your hearts, and you need to be willing to follow that truth. It's really, um, I mean, there are churches that do teach the truth. I hope by God's grace we're doing some of that here. But it's not enough to hear it and just to stock your mind with it. Yes, I see that. I, I understand that. That's biblical. Maybe I'll get around to doing it someday. You know? No. You need to see it and you need to do it. I need to do it. We all need to do it if we are to arrive in heaven. Got to keep moving forward. Have to grow up. And in order to grow up, you need to have the truth, but you need to be willing to do it as well. And then the final reason which actually comes from our text, is fear. I want you to notice that the disciples were afraid to ask Jesus about what he had just said. Uh, maybe they were afraid of rebuke. Maybe they were afraid that they would be thought ignorant by Jesus and so forth. Maybe they just didn't want to know because of the consequences of what Jesus was saying. Some truths in the Bible are kind of scary. And maybe sometimes we stay away from them because we really don't want to hear them. Well, sometimes it is because we don't want to be thought ignorant. Maybe we don't want to ask questions because of our pride. We shouldn't let that get in our way. Uh, I was going to uh, point out that, um, and I don't, don't, youth don't, or those who are younger don't think that I'm picking on you here, but um, I do know that when, when you're younger and you think you know everything and that your parents don't know anything, you don't want to ask a question because you don't want to break that facade that I know everything. I want to make sure my parents understand I know everything. The problem with that is, is you don't know everything. Okay, you don't. And the reason why you think you might know everything is because you know so little <laughs> that you really don't understand what you don't know. And uh, again, uh, sometimes your mind's working faster than your parents' minds, but it doesn't mean that your parents don't know what you need to learn. But the fact is, we all do not know everything that we need to learn. And it's not a sign of weakness to ask questions. It's actually a sign of wisdom if we can admit that we don't know everything and we ask somebody for help. Uh, realize that the Lord gave you teachers. He gave all of us teachers. We still need teachers. We do need to grow up but there's a sense in which we need continually to be learning, so don't throw your teachers away. Don't be afraid of being thought ignorant. But here's the, the biggest, I think, obstacle. Sometimes we're afraid to learn what it is that the Lord wants to teach us because we know that once we've learned it, that the Lord is going to hold us accountable for it. That's kind of a scary thing, isn't it? There's an old saying, <clears throat> ignorance is bliss. What I don't know can't hurt me. Well, the problem is it can hurt you. Uh, you can apply this here in, in the things of the Lord. You can say, if I don't know it, 
uh, the Lord's not going to hold me accountable for it. He's not going to fault me. Because once I do know it, I know he's going to hold me responsible. I know he's going to want me to do it. And so sometimes we say, maybe I should just leave that alone. Uh, I'm not ready for that. Well, that is a problem because we need to overcome these things in order to grow. Remember, the Lord commands you to learn. He commands you to grow. That's something you can't avoid. You have to press forward. You need to grow up. And by the way, if, if you're not willing to do it, what is the Lord going to do to make sure that you do it? I mean, he is a parent, right? And he's a father and he's a faithful father. He will make sure that you do it. And if you're not doing it, he will bring what is necessary to bring that about. One of the things that he does is he brings messages like this to remind you and to remind me that we need to move forward. And after speaking to us in this way, if we don't move forward, he has other ways that he can do it as well, especially once you've heard it. It's amazing that in the past in this church years ago, there were a number of issues, a number of problems within the congregation, and it seemed like every sermon that was preached would bring with it a wave of, of activity, of discipline from the Lord. Uh, so things, explosions were going off all the time throughout several years. It was just, it was crazy. But I did see the connection between those two things by God's grace. This is preached, this happens. This, be careful what you preach. But no, the Lord said, this is the message. This is what has to be preached. These are the consequences. If we don't respond to the message, the Lord will help us. He will bring what's necessary into our lives to help us to move forward. Is that because he hates us, he's mean, and he wants uh, to, to be harsh? No, it's because he loves you and he loves me. And he knows it's not good for us to avoid what we have to go through. And so he will make sure that we go through it for our own good. Now, I do think, too, that this may be one of the reasons why people actually do get addicted to the things that they get addicted to why some people bury themselves in, in drugs and immorality or into entertainment and it is in the world in general and why some people just go out on the streets and decide you know, they don't want to deal with the responsibilities of life is because they don't want to grow up. I mean, it works in, in let's say, in a, at a global level. Uh, people who don't want to grow up, who don't want to mature, who don't want to face responsibilities, they... They have to find some place to hide. And these are some of the things that they hide in. And I think sometimes we bury ourselves in those pleasures, I was telling you, that are actually lawful because we're avoiding what it is we know is the price that we have to pay to follow the Lord. There is a cost to growing up. It does mean that you need to take on greater responsibilities. It means that you're not going to have somebody standing between you and the harsh realities of the world. That's why some of our children, I mean, they, they think they want to grow up and they want to be out on their own. And once they get out there, they say, boy, I sure had it good at home. Why did I want to do this? I mean, I, I didn't have to worry about all these things. I had a shield in front of me that was protecting me. But when you grow up and you take responsibility, you become that shield for somebody else. You've got to step up to the plate. Well, Jesus was doing that for his disciples, but they had to grow up, and they had to become that for others. And that's a hard thing to do. It's hard to be responsible for yourself. It's hard to take the yoke that Jesus says we must enter into, the one that he calls us to bear. It's, it's not easy in one sense, but in another sense it is because the Lord says that even though he calls us to be that shield, even though he calls us to grow up and to take that yoke upon ourselves, that he's in the yoke with us and that he is helping us bear it. He's going to give us the strength. He's going to give us the ability to endure those things because of his grace and his mercy. Now realize too that as you grow, the more that you can bear, the more the Lord is going to place on your shoulders. That's uh, one of the things that happens when you grow up, is God's going to give you more. But realize as well, 
that the greater the responsibility the Lord gives you to bear, the greater will be the rewards, both of blessing in this life as well as blessing in the life to come. It's really when you begin to step up, you grow up, and you begin to do what the Lord has called you to do, and you bear these responsibilities that you begin to suffer the persecutions that the Lord said you would have to endure, that Paul said that he wanted to know of the Lord Jesus Christ, that I might know the fellowship of his sufferings. But it's at those times that you also sense the power of his resurrection working within you, and that is, of course, his spirit. That's how you get to know the Lord Jesus Christ. That's when Paul says that he presses forward that he may know him. He didn't mean getting alone in his study, uh, writing the Bible, reading the Old Testament, uh, praying. That's not just what he was referring to. But he was talking about the sufferings and the work he was doing for the Lord. That is how he got to know Jesus, was through that work. He endured sufferings, as you know, great big catalog of sufferings, 2 Corinthians 9. But we also see in Paul's life a great deal of power that came through knowing Jesus Christ and the work that he had called him to do. So this text is exhorting each one of us to press on to maturity, to set the world aside when it gets in your way, and to learn what it is that Jesus has to teach you in his word daily as you get in his word and spend time with him but also weekly as you would meet with the Lord in the services that he has ordained for this very purpose. You need to stop being afraid to grow up, but embrace it as a necessary part of your service to the Lord. The Lord wants you to be a spiritual adult and not a perpetual child. He wants you to grow up. Now, just one final thing, and, and that is I've been addressing mainly Christians, although I realize that um, I have addressed non-believers as well, but let me just make this last point. There is a starting point for learning, and that is, of course, by learning of your need of the Lord Jesus Christ if you have not yet learned it. That's where you need to begin. The Lord gave his law, the Ten Commandments, so that you would see your sin, so that you would see your need of a savior. If you don't see your sins, you're not going to know that you need Jesus Christ. And so I just want to encourage you that if you haven't yet learned this, that you do these four things. I think four things that um, are necessary things in order to become a believer. The first one is you need to begin to read. But you need to begin to read a book that's perhaps even more foundational than the Bible, at least um, in a certain sense, because it does come, it comes before the Bible, and that is the book of nature. You know, the Lord actually created what he created in this world so that everyone would know he exists and would have no excuse for their unbelief. Uh, when we talked about uh, the uh, infinite power of God, that he's created billions of galaxies out there. Those billions of galaxies were not to raise the, uh, you know, the idea of the skeptic that God can't exist because of all these things that exist out there. God, uh, we can't be, there can't be life only on this planet because you know, this would be just an incredible waste of space and, and of energy and so forth if God had made all those things for nothing. God didn't put all these plants and all their intricacy and all the, all the different types of animals he's put into the world as well as beauty and smells and, and tastes and everything else just for us to look at it and say what a, what a marvelous accident that could bring all this about. It's like uh, the uh, uh, example that R.C. Sproul gave one time. If you're walking along in the jungle, you see nothing but you know, trees and everything just sort of growing randomly. And then you come into this opening, you see this carefully planted garden, all nicely arranged and so forth, uh, different things to eat and different flowers, that, different beauty. You, you see this organization. You don't look at that garden and say, what a marvelous accident that this would just grow like this out of nowhere. But you say, I wonder where the gardener is. It's got to be around somewhere. Somebody planted this garden. You can see it in the design and the order of the thing. The well, same thing is true in nature. 
Uh, God has written a book for everyone to read that shows us that he exists, so you need to read that book and be firmly convinced of what you already know. God exists. Secondly, you need to read the law of God to understand what God requires. He wants you to love him, and he wants you to love your neighbor as yourself, but as you read the law of God, you see, you know what, I haven't done that. I haven't actually wanted to do that. I enjoy not loving God. I enjoy not loving my neighbor as myself. But I also see God is going to hold me accountable for that. So you need to be convicted that you've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then you need to learn from the gospel what God has done to save sinners. That he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And then if you cannot believe in the Lord, if you cannot receive his son and trust in him, you need to pray that God would give you the grace to do that, that he would break through your hatred and your stony heart, that he would humble you, and that you would actually trust Jesus and turn from your sins. And then you need to begin to press forward toward holiness. You need to press forward toward maturity. You need to grow up. You need to learn from the Lord, both from his word, what you are to do, and you need to begin to, to begin doing what the Lord calls you to do, that you may truly learn who Jesus Christ really is and know him the way that Paul says that each of us needs to know him. Well, may the Lord grant his mercy and his grace to each one of us to listen to what he says and to remember what he says and not just to agree with it, that's a good thing, but actually to do it. It's only if we do it that it's going to make any difference in our lives, that we are going to grow and be able to do what God wants us to do. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's pray that the Lord would apply his word to us.